the president elect of the United States of America. It was perhaps the most stunning upset in US political history. Donald J. Trump, a property tycoon, reality TV star and demagogue with zero political experience, roused an angry, nationalistic segment of the US electorate to become the most powerful man on earth. Together, we will make America great again. But since his election victory, Trump's gone from threatening nuclear war with North Korea. They will be met with fire and fury. To palling around with Kim Jong-un. And has escalated conflicts across the Middle East, from Syria to Yemen to Palestine. Meanwhile, a special counsel continues to investigate whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russia to win the presidency. My guest tonight, a vocal supporter of Donald Trump, has called the Russia investigation a witch hunt and a hoax. But the retired US Navy commander and former Pentagon spokesman is himself a former Trump campaign official who's become entangled in the Mueller investigation. So, is Trump really succeeding in making America and the world great again? I'm Mehdi Hassan, and I've come here to the Oxford Union to go head-to-head -head with J.D. Gordon, the Trump campaign's director of national security. I'll challenge him on the president's alleged collusion with Russia and ask whether Donald Trump is really fit to be the so-called leader of the free world. Tonight, I'll also be joined by Mark Porter, president of Republicans overseas in France and an advisor to the Trump-Pence 2020 re-election campaign. Ellie Guerin Meyer, Senior Policy Fellow for the Middle East and North Africa Program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And David K. Johnson, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and the author of the Trump biography, The Making of Donald Trump. And it's even worse than you think what the Trump administration is doing to America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome J.D. Gordon. <laughs> J.D. Gordon currently runs a strategic communications firm based in Washington, D.C., and has served as a national security and foreign policy advisor to three Republican presidential candidates. J.D. Gordon, do you believe Donald Trump is president of the United States today because of collusion between his election campaign, the campaign you were part of, and the Russian government? No, not at all as far as collusion with Russia. The collusion with Russia narrative is a hoax. It's the witch hunt of the century. It's basically been a shakedown and um, it's ruined a lot of lives, frankly. And it's basically an excuse from the Democrats for losing the election when Hillary Clinton was heavily favored to win. Just to be clear then, when you say it's a hoax, are you saying the allegations of the Trump campaign that you were part of working with Russians or Russian government officials or cutouts is a hoax? Or are you saying that the idea that the Russians interfered in the American election campaign in order to try and get their preferred candidate, Donald J. Trump, elected, that's a hoax? Because the second view is the view of the US intelligence community. It's the view of the US Senate Intelligence Committee. So I'm just wondering where you stand. I do believe that the Russian government interfered in the US election, so that is not a hoax to investigate that. However, the Russians didn't impact the election that I know of as far as swinging the vote. I just think Hillary Clinton was not a very good candidate, and she didn't go to places uh, in the Midwest where she should have went. It's not a national election. It's, it's a 50-state yeah. election, and President Trump won handily in the Electoral College. What I don't get is, this is an investigation that's produced in just over a year, more than 30 indictments, five guilty pleas, including the president's former national security advisor, his deputy campaign chairman, his campaign foreign policy advisor. It doesn't sound like a hoax or a witch hunt. It sounds like you were working with a bunch of confessed criminals to get Donald Trump elected. Well, what I had said was that the collusion narrative is a hoax. I say it's like that because it's rounded up a bunch of people who were innocent of at least collusion of the charges. So you have people going to jail. One's in jail now, as we speak. His photo in a mugshot was just Paul released. Manafort, Paul Manafort, the former right. campaign chairman, who has extensive ties to Russia, as we know. Correct. However, he was not uh, put in jail because of collusion with Russia. There was no collusion whatsoever. Once you get put under investigation, Everything's on the table, and several people are going to prison for a couple lying to the FBI, General Which Michael a, Flynn. Yeah, a felony. Interviewed. Yes. A felony crime. No Correct. one forced him to lie to the FBI. He made a mistake. He didn't have a lawyer with him. Um, he got 
strong-armed by the FBI. George Papadopoulos... strong-armed. A I... former three-star general who ran a US intelligence agency and lied to the FBI about his conversations with Russians, secret conversations, he got strong-armed. I think he made some mistakes. Poor little general. Uh, you say there was no collusion. You say it's a hoax and a witch hunt. The problem is that there seems to be so much evidence that suggests otherwise. For example, let's talk about the Trump Tower meeting, June 9th, 2016. Donald Trump Jr., son of the president, gets an email telling him that Russians have information that would, quote, incriminate Hillary Clinton as part of, quote, Russia and its government support for Mr. Trump. He doesn't say, uh-oh, I better call the FBI and report this. He says, quote, I love it. And then he and Jared Kushner and Paul Manafort invite those Russians to Trump Tower, one of whom later admits to her ties to the Kremlin. And if that wasn't bad enough, at that meeting, Don Trump Jr. asks them for dirt on Hillary Clinton and her foundation. If that's not collusion, if that's not working with Russians, what is? Well, that's not collusion. Basically, Don Trump Jr. took a meeting he should not have taken. He was a political novice, just like George Papadopoulos and Carter Page, two guys who were on the National Security Advisory Committee, uh, of which I was the director. So you had people doing um, things they should not have doing, taking meetings they shouldn't have taken, traveling to places they shouldn't have traveled to. But that's not collusion. Uh, it's poor judgment, but it's not collusion. When you say it's, it's poor judgment, but that goes to the heart of it, people on your campaign said they were asked. Nope, no context whatsoever, never happened. Never happened, none, zero. And then suddenly, one after another after another, I think by one count more than 24, 24 something meetings there have been between Trump officials and Russians, more than 80 odd contacts, texts, emails, DMs. If there's nothing to hide, why are these senior people, a, form, a, a senator, a general, why are they lying time and again? Why are they getting caught lying if there's nothing to hide? I just don't get it. Well, uh, speaking for Attorney General Sessions, who was my boss on the campaign and a senator, when he was testifying for the Senate for the Attorney General position, he basically had said that he wasn't aware of Russian contacts. Um, he had a very long hearing. Uh, I think he was rope-a-doped a little bit, so he was just so tired, wasn't remembering <sighs> shaking the Russian ambassador's hand in the crowd. No, he met him on more than one occasion. It was more than a hand check. I mean, a couple is, times. So your defense, basically, so far, is we're novices, we're tired, we're incompetent. That's the defense. It's cock-up, <laughs> not conspiracy. Not me. <laughs> well, you were part of the campaign. I was. Well, yeah, some even people you, in the even you, even you, you told Business Insider... Uh, that you did nothing at the Republican National Convention that had anything to do with changing the party's platform on military aid to Ukraine. There was a huge criticism that Donald Trump had softened the Republican Party's position on Ukraine and Russia, thrown 70 years of GOP foreign policy out of the window. You said, ah, I was sitting at a desk, I never moved, and then months later you admitted, actually, you were involved in phone calls, in negotiations, in changing that party platform. Well, Even you weren't 100 percent forthcoming. According to the media, but Business Insider, they lie like the best of them. Okay. That's not what I told the Business Insider. What I told Business Insider was that I disagreed with the characterization from a, a delegate from Texas, an 82-year-old woman named Diana Denman, who was adamant about going to the GOP platform and introducing an amendment to arm Ukraine, of which I advised the delegates that uh, that was a bad idea and inconsistent with President Trump's worldview, Mr. Trump's worldview at the time, and inconsistent with the policy at the time under President Obama. However, that got spun in the Business Insider and other media to saying I denied being involved. That's not what I said. I just said I dis dis disagreed with Diana Denman's recollection of events. You know who did deny you were involved? Paul Manafort, your boss, the campaign chairman, he said nobody from the campaign was involved in changing the party's position on Russia and Ukraine. Turns out someone was involved, J.D. Gordon. That was very unfortunate. Uh, oh, okay, it so was. Bad memory. Was, Let's just make the list. Was. Bad memory, incompetence, novice, unfortunate. Yeah, there you no, go. Nothing. There's you no, summed it up. Wow. Okay. So that's, so that's the argument. For all of these contacts that were hidden, all of these conversations that happened that were never reported, all of these ties. I mean, the Trump Tower meeting is a fascinating one because even Steve Bannon, who last time I checked wasn't part of the liberal media, wasn't a Democrat, served loyally under Donald Trump for a long period, even he said it was unpatriotic and treasonous to take that meeting in Trump Tower. Did Donald Trump Jr. and Paul Manafort, did they take that group of Russian lobbyists, one of whom has ties to the Kremlin, to see the president? You were working for the campaign then. Not the, that I know of, but uh, the interesting story about that is that was in June of 2016. I was the director of national security, but I was based in Washington. Isn't there a problem then with your narrative? That on the one hand, you'll say you're in the campaign, it was incompetence, you know, I knew these people, et cetera, et cetera. 
On the other hand, when I'm asking you about a quite damning meeting, you're like, well, I wasn't in town, and I didn't know about it. Well, I wasn't you based at Trump Tower. Ways. Well, you can't have it both ways. Of, so of, you don't know yeah. about the levels of collusion. Well, I... You don't know about other meetings that may have gone on. He, Maybe you should support yes. Bob Mueller getting to the bottom However, of it. However, I do know that he, there has been an investigation, multiple investigations going on, starting yeah. in the summer of 2016, two years, including by, by the FBI. There has been no evidence that shows collusion. Okay. Bad judgment, yeah, plenty of evidence for that. Okay. Let's go to our, our, our panel. Uh, David K. Johnston is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist, author of the Trump biography, The Making of Donald Trump, and the book, It's Even Worse Than You Think, What the Trump Administration is Doing mm -hmm. to America. Uh, David, uh, the reality is that the pro-Trump side is right in saying that there is nothing so far tying Donald Trump himself to any kind of collusion, is it? You'd have to concede that point. Uh, well, Donald has spent 30 years deeply involved with Russians and Russian criminals. But one thing the two of you didn't discuss is that Jared Kushner, a White House paid employee and Donald Trump's son-in-law, went to the Russians and asked to use their secret diplomatic communications in the Washington Embassy to have a secret channel to the Kremlin. If that doesn't tell you there was collusion going on, I don't know what does. Imagine if any other president that had happened. Let me put that point to Mark Porter is here from Paris, uh, president of Republicans uh, overseas over there. He's also been an advisor to the Trump-Pence 2020 re-election campaign. Mark, I've got a question for you, but before I ask it, you're, you're kind of exasperated. You're holding up your exasperated. hands at David. <laughs> Respond to what you heard from David K. Johnston. <clears throat> Well, first of all, you make it sound like this is the first time this has ever happened. You guys are sounding like you're amateurs up here because we know how this works inside of campaigns. Every campaign does this. Hillary, every campaign goes and has to use Russian secret diplomatic Wait, communications. Speak, you had your turn. Okay. Let, now, first of all, this kind of thing is not unusual, and collusion is not illegal. Let me explain what collusion is. The reason they're using collusion is because they can't find anything else. There is no corruption. There is no collaboration, Apart which is illegal. More than 30 collusion. Wait, wait, slow guilty, down. Please. Let me finish. Okay. Because this idea of collusion being something yeah. that's really horrible, we collude all the time in terms of communicating. I speak with Russians all the time. Everybody does, including the Hillary campaign. Now, if you guys would spend as much time looking at the other side of the campaign as you do with us, you will see that you're making a big thing out of it. And if we are wasting our time so, so just, just to these check, things, Just to check. Yes. Isn't it odd? Don't you find it odd? You know Donald Trump. Don't you find it odd that this is a man who has an insulting, demeaning nickname for everyone? How come he never says anything critical about Vladimir Putin? Everyone in the world he, he criticizes. Has. And what yet Putin, he heaps praise what on him. are you what? talking about? Can you about? tell me what he said critical about Vladimir Putin? You can Putin? ask him directly. Hold on, hold on. Let me ask my question. He is called Putin a strong leader, a better leader than Obama. He would give him an A-plus grade. Could he be my best friend? I've got a long list. Where's the critical <laughs> remarks about Why Vladimir Putin? Why is that Putin? funny when you only hear half of the side of the well, story? I'm I'm, I'm he is also so criticizing The floor is Putin. yours. What has he said about Putin? Are you kidding me? Are you really serious? Now, if you've only done half of your homework, I'm not going to do the rest of it for you. Let's bring Ellie, who's been waiting very patiently. Ellie Gerenmeyer is a senior policy fellow for the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. How much has Donald Trump's seemingly pro-Russian policies undermined the Atlantic Alliance, the NATO, the European Union? Or are we blowing this Russia stuff up out of all proportion? Well, Matty, what is a real shock, at least in Europe, who are you know, European allies of the United States, is the degree of demeaning nature and tone that's being used towards leader after leader, in the alliance structure, the way that NATO is being attacked uh, by, by words or pressures, which, which all creates this image, even if it may not be true, but certainly a strong impression that President Trump does favor a much more transactional relationship with someone like Mr. Putin than keeping an alliance structure in place. And we've seen recently with the, the meetings of the G7, with the meetings of NATO leaders, with the types of North comments. Korea. <laughs> well, North Korea, last time I checked, isn't an we're, ally of the United States. Whereas it should the, be, and that's we're, what we're working on. Well, well I think we'll this, is, this, is, this yes. is where the, the real worry is, is that will Mr. Putin have more of a sway on US foreign policy decision making and trade policy, et cetera, than European allies will. And okay. this is a huge issue. And JD Gordon, why do you think Putin wanted Trump elected? 
Well, I think that Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State was trying to destabilize Russia in 2014. I think that he saw her as, a, as an enemy, and I think that he felt he wanted to attack the United States, and, and this is the way they did it. It's not just the United States. Russia attacks our European allies, too. But he wanted a candidate like who was warfare. more in line with his views. I mean, that's cheaper than fighting a war. OK, well, I'm glad you can concede that. And uh, we've got to move on, but I do want to ask you this, just on a personal point. You've been interviewed not just by congressional committees, but by the Robert Mueller special counsel team as well. Do you worry that he may end up sending you to prison too? No, not at all. But don't think they haven't tried. Hmm. Uh, anybody who's been before a congressional committee or the special counsel, and there have been about 50 Trump associates who have been before these. That's why I say it's a hoax and a witch hunt. Because it takes things like shaking the Russian ambassador's hand in a crowd after I give a speech, and then the media turn that into some nefarious activity, and you get asked about it, of course. Let's talk about North Korea. Let's talk foreign yeah. policy. J.D. Gordon, you've said that North Korea has been, quote, a top threat to America and our allies. You've said the threat from North Korea is very real. So do you now agree or disagree with the President of the United States, your former boss, who says, quote, there is no longer a nuclear threat from North Korea? I think he was trying to talk in the strategic macro sense, like he's had this great talk with uh, Kim Jong-un right now, and so there's no longer a nuclear threat. Not in the technical sense, because in the technical sense... That's there flatly is. untrue. There is a nuclear threat from North Korea. In the strategic sense, he says, oh, we're getting along now. He tends to talk in very broad, sweeping terms. I and I admire your ability to try and defend him with strategic and technical. It's not true to say North Korea is not a nuclear threat. That's just demonstrably false statement. In the technical sense, but okay, in, in the, the broad strategic maybe. sense, he was Come trying on. to make it. <laughs> in fact, according to US intelligence, North Korea has actually, quote, increased its production of fuel for nuclear weapons at multiple secret sites and is considering ways to conceal its weapons. One US intelligence official said there is absolutely unequivocal evidence that they're trying to deceive the US. President Trump is trying to do something different that we haven't had other presidents have the ability to do, and that is to rein in the nuclear program of North Korea and the missile program at all. So, so far since President Trump has made this outreach and has basically met with Kim Jong-un, we haven't seen any nuclear tests, we haven't seen any missile tests. Just six months ago, we were at the brink of a war. But then you have Iran, where Donald Trump pulls the United States out of the Iran nuclear deal against the advice of his defense secretary, against the advice of his secretary of state, against the advice of his national security advisor, against the advice of his European allies, against the advice of America's leading non-proliferation experts. How are you okay with a one-page document of empty promises from North Korea, which is hailed as the end of the nuclear threat, while tearing up a 159-page document of verified inspections negotiated over two years with Iran and backed up by the IAEA. How do you square the two? Because North Korea basically just wants to survive. The Kim dynasty, he's the third one now. His grandfather was the founder of the regime. His father carried it on. He's the third one. He just wants to pass it on to his children someday. He wants to survive. Iran wants to conquer the rest of the Middle East. They want to be the regional powerhouse. In 1979, the whole revolution was about exporting revolutionary Islam. It's a Shia version of Islam, and their sworn enemies are people like our allies, like UAE, like the Saudis. And so Iran has a very different view. Okay, it's a view North, of conquest. Hold on. North Korea's enemies are also your allies, Japan, South Korea. Here's my question to you. Um, we can all agree that meeting with dictators and despots is a good thing if you're going to avoid war. I think people should reach out. I'm not against negotiations. A lot of people aren't against negotiations. What they don't get is... OK, Trump wants to meet with these people, but why does he have to slobber over them when he does it? Why does he have to... Why is he such a fan of tyrants and despots? Why does he heap such praise on them? In a way that US presidents, who've all met with dictators, have never done so publicly, this kind of embarrassing hugging and well, fawning. Well, Barack Obama bowed down to the king of Saudi Arabia. So did Donald Trump, just for the record, and he sword he danced know. with them as well. In fact, he went to Saudi, <laughs> he Arabia, before, he went to Saudi Arabia before any other country, so I think that's a bit of a weak criticism yeah, of Obama. Not, uh, let's uh, let's ask the question. Yeah. He says, Kim Jong-un uh, is a talented man who loves his country very much. Do you believe the oppressed, persecuted, starved people of totalitarian North Korea, quote, love Kim Jong-un with a great fervor? Because that's what Donald Trump says. Uh, is I, he a talented man who loves his people very much? I, th I think he loves his people very much. As Do you far think his as people love him? Well, they're taught to because it's a cult in North Korea. However... Wow. You're not willing to criticise the president at all, even when he says stuff you clearly uh, disagree with. Well, I, I'm trying to put it in the, in the right perspective. I think that The right president perspective Trump, is what? They love him in a cult-like way. It's unfortunate, but it's the reality. Sounds, that sounds so, familiar, talking of people who love in a cult-like way. Unless you're going to yeah. take him out by force, what are you going to do? OK, well, let's, let's go to our, our panel here. Um, Mark Porter, do you now agree 
that the Republican Party's position is that the chairman of North Korea isn't brutal and heartless, as George Bush once called him, but he's smart, he's talented, he's got a great personality. That's Donald Trump's view of him. Matty, that's not his view. That's a negotiating position, and you know it. So and, this if, is... and if Barack Obama had gone to North Korea, hugged Kim Jong-un, put out a coin, and said he was a talented man who was loved by his people, Republicans would be impeaching him by now. The you know reason, that. The reason is, and the reason that we have opposition parties and live in a democracy is so that we do keep people in alignment. Now, I want to go back and answer your question yeah. that you, you asked me before. Trump is not insulting Putin because there's no reason to do so now. In negotiations, you insult people, you put them in their place, you position them so you had the best advantage in negotiating. Putin has not insulted Trump, so therefore there's no need to do that now. Okay, Ellie Garamani, we're hearing a lot from J.D. Gordon about the difference between North Korea and Iran. Apparently North Korea just wants to survive, Iran wants to conquer, therefore you do a deal with North Korea and you tear up the deal with Iran. Is that how you see it? Well, first I'd say, Mehdi, that the last time I checked, because Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, they haven't been able to threaten the United States with a nuclear weapon in the same way as North Korea was. So if we're taking Mr. Trump's America First strategy, uh, you'd see a clear line of why the North Korean threat needs to be dealt with much more significantly so. I think the real problem at the moment is that President Trump violated and exited a nuclear agreement that was enshrined by UN law, UN Security Council resolution, without an alternative. And really, the only answer that the Republican establishment has given is bomb Iran. Bomb, bomb, That's bomb Iran. That's not our response. This That's is a line. response. That's and there is a disingenuous true. offer to negotiate a grand bargain with Iran, whereas the opening unconditional offer seems to be a total capitulation of the regime. And this is not how you negotiate, certainly not with a Middle Eastern partner. Frankly, most, most of the U.S. administration officials that worked on it didn't even read the deal until six months into, uh, because I've checked, because I've checked okay. a number. And so this is, this is, I think, the real point, is that what does President Trump want to do uh, from uh, here on? Well, I, I need to bring in David. You've written about Donald Trump for decades now. You've known Donald Trump for decades from New York days. Let me ask you this on a, kind of, on a, on a personal level. Why do you think it is that Trump likes these strong men and dictators and, 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 and fawns over them. Is it a negotiating strategy or is it something he envies about them, he wants to be like them? What is your assessment? Well, Donald is a man who has thumbed his nose at the law his entire life. He is the third generation head of a white collar crime family. His grandfather was a pimp, his father was a thief who stole from the federal government. Donald has uh, cheated workers, he's cheated uh, vendors, he's cheated governments, he's gone to extreme lengths to cheat. And it is Donald's nature to see in other people who are strong bosses who thumb their nose at convention that those are the people he wants to be like. And this is a man who, when he was asked in the debates about nuclear, you know, what would your strategy be regarding the nuclear triad? Oh, it's awesome, it's awesome. But what's your strategy about the triad? Oh, it's, it's awesome, it's just, it's, he doesn't know anything. He said he knows a lot about nuclear because his uncle was a nuclear Yeah, professor. and he doesn't know jack about it. And so what he's done is he's uh. elevated Kim to his own people. He has given him propaganda devices. He has helped him okay. to solidify his control. J.D. Gordon, let me ask you this, uh, before we go to the break. How worried should we be about the prospect of nuclear war on a Donald Trump presidency? Senator Bob Corker, Republican chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has said that Trump could be leading us towards World War III. How worried should we be that this kind of impulsive, erratic president with a lack of foreign policy experience and who likes the idea of nuclear weapons. Not worried, use not worried in, in my view. But I, I think, Mehdi, it's important to, to understand that a lot of people miss the forest for the trees on President Trump. President Trump and the, the Make America Great Again slogan is really a movement. If it wasn't him, it would be somebody else because there's a lot of anger and resentment in the American population. It's a very divided country. Russia helped stoke that division, by the way. But if it wasn't Mr. Trump, it would be somebody else. In part two, when we come back, we're going to talk about Donald Trump, the man, who he is, how we should judge him, how worried should we be, and some of the controversy surrounding uh, what he's said and done. We'll also hear from our patient audience here in the Oxford Union. So join us for Head to Head after the break. Welcome back to Head to Head here at the Oxford Union. My guest today is J.D. Gordon, uh, former national security advisor to the Donald Trump election campaign, former Pentagon spokesman. We've been talking about 
Russian collusion, North Korean nuclear weapons. Let's talk about Donald Trump himself. You were an advisor to Trump during his bid for the presidency. You met with him. You spoke with him. Can I ask you on behalf of millions, perhaps billions of people around the world, what was it like working for this former reality TV star, who, if you wanted to be polite, you would say is unorthodox, unconventional. Perhaps if you weren't being so polite, you might say is a deluded, narcissistic man-child. Well, I'd say he's a brilliant man. He became the president of the United States. Uh, he had a very successful career in real estate, casinos. I grew up at the Jersey Shore. And when I was uh, a preteen, he was already famous. You know, he's a guy who's been around in the public eye a very long time. And he, he basically is an anti-establishment character, like I was mentioning. About, I'm just trying to get to the bottom, but I know you're not going to tell me, but I'm trying to get to the bottom of your perspective of this guy. You come from this military Pentagon background, and you come to work for a guy. I mean, does he know anything about the world? Because he doesn't seem to when he speaks about the world. He does. He thinks Ireland is in the UK. He thinks Israel isn't in the Middle East. He thinks Germany owes the US money for NATO. He doesn't understand how NATO works. He thinks Nambia is a country in Africa. He can't tell the difference between the Quds Force and the Kurds. As Governor Huckabee told me. But does he me, know anything about the world? He does. He does. And Governor Huckabee said, and he's right, this is the best chance we have for a fresh vision for the United States. The United States is $20 trillion in debt. Okay. We can't be the world's policeman forever, and that's typically a Democrat position. Trump's but now solution the Democrats has been to increase the debt by record margins, but we'll leave that discussion for another day. Isn't another problem of working on foreign policy with a man like Donald Trump is that he doesn't like foreigners? He's kind of racist. He married some. <laughs> He's racist. <laughs> no, I, I would disagree with that. And he does like foreigners. Melania is from Slovenia. Okay. Sorry. You said he likes. You said he likes. You're right. You're right. You said he likes Vladimir Putin. I, you're right. Right. He, he likes white foreigners. Yes, oh, I agree with that. Oh, yeah. I mean, well let, well, well, let me ask you this. Because Mark's, Mark's getting upset, and we'll come to Mark in a moment. When he compares Syrian refugees to snakes, says everyone from Haiti has AIDS, calls African countries S-hole countries, accuses Mexico of sending that. over rapists and drug dealers, calls immigrants invaders who are infesting the United States, uh, blames terrorist attacks on the Muslim mayor of London, retweets white nationalists, praises neo-Nazis as very fine people, singles out black athletes for abuse, attacks a Hispanic judge as Mexican. None of that's racist. Well, I would tell you that he uh, did the sword dance, as you said, with the Saudi uh, leadership, Saudi that's, king, right? That's your response to what I just well, read out? That I, he danced I, let me get with to the that Saudis? Point. Let me get to that point. He also said nice things about Kim Jong-un just now. So how could he be racist against foreigners who are not white? So you, you basically just made an argument. That I just I wanted explained to how he could be racist. How do you defend? Yeah. You OK, let me ask you this. Do you yeah. share the views that I just read out? No, I don't. Why do you think he said those things? I think President Trump says whatever he wants to say. That doesn't at any not given make time. him a racist. Sorry to break that. No, I, I don't think he's a racist uh, whatsoever. Do you think the I, comment? I think... OK, OK. Do you think the comments he made are legitimately perceived as racist? I think he makes comments that he probably shouldn't make. I wouldn't make them, what? certainly. OK, so let me ask you this. Why shouldn't he make them? Because they're racist. <laughs> <laughs> I would just say that President Trump is his own man, and people are missing the force for the You can be your own man him. and say things you shouldn't say and still be a racist. I'm, I'm not hearing a defense here of anything. The issue okay. is, we were called racist. So many people that are conservatives who are not racist were called that. I get that. By Hillary but I'm not Clinton calling lots of conservatives racist. In fact, right. other conservatives have called him racist. Paul Ryan, House Speaker, yeah. said his comments about Judge Richard Curiel, a yeah. Latino judge, were the textbook definition of racism. That's the leading conservative accused Donald Trump of racism. He's had a lot of en enemies in Congress, but you have okay. to remember from the polls a, in the United States, conspiracy. the Congress has uh, the approval rating is around 12%, 13%. You're so... really going to do polls? J.D. Gould, the yeah, majority... Yeah, sure. Uh, according to the polls, the majority of Americans think Donald Trump is racist. Well, I would tell We're you gonna that... We're going to play the poll games. I, the majority I, of Americans. I would tell you that, oh, that he attacks poll? Congress okay. all the time, Democrats okay. and Republicans, because they attack him all the time. Okay. It's not just his racism, though. He also He's not does racist. seem to. You can't Mark, say that. we will come to you and you will make the defense, I'm sure, very well. Uh, or you might ask me a question back. Je it's not just his racism, though. He's also a serial congenital liar. The Washington Post has kept account of 3,000 false or misleading claims he has made since coming to office. The Toronto Star's count is at 2,000 false things he said. That's around three and a half lies a day. A day. How are we supposed to believe anything he says about anything? How did you believe anything he told you about anything? 
Well, the issue is he was elected because the American people don't care. Do you think he just started saying whatever he wanted <laughs> when he got elected? Best, no. That is the best defense of Donald Trump's lie they've ever said. People Jimmy, don't care. So he is a liar. <laughs> yeah. So he is a liar, but people don't care. No, that's the, a good defense. The American, I'll give you that. The, he was elected. Do you think he just started to say whatever he wanted when he got elected? No, he was lying before he was elected. He's been in the public life for decades. And he's been lying for decades. Start, well, my point is the American people don't care. This issue is but bigger that wasn't than my point. Trump. I didn't ask whether the American people cared or not. I asked... How can you take anything he says seriously, given he's a liar and you've conceded he's a liar? How can you take him seriously yeah. he's the president of the United States? No, that's not what I mean. I said if he asks you something, if he tells you to do something about foreign policy, if he makes a promise that we will do X, how can you believe him when he tells three and a half lies at minimum a day? Well, I, first of all, I would disagree with that statistic because okay, statistics are often wrong statistic. about fake news. But he tells lots of lies as you've conceded. How can you trust him? Working with Mr. Trump is basically rolling with the punches. So... <laughs> You have to be able to see, okay, That's how can a, I best This is a great impact? euphemism, rolling with the punches, you mean rolling roll with, with the, the lies. But no, okay. he, he's Fine. done a lot of great things for the United States. We're $20 trillion Fine. in this debt, great he's trying to sort it out. The fact that you're $20 trillion in debt has nothing to do with the fact that he's a liar. Um, Mark, you're getting very agitated, you're jumping in here. Uh, Mark, tell me why Donald Trump is not a liar and a racist. Look, you've taken all those comments out of context. All of you them. have chaired okay. all of them. Okay. And you did it on purpose to make this sort of little argument here. And that's Am I the first person? To accuse Donald Trump of racism. <coughs> Just me. There's not, as I said, majority of Americans think so according to the polls. The majority of Americans do not think, think so. That is absolutely not true. Hold on, hold on. Now, Ted first Cruz, hold on, hold on. Ted Cruz, Jeb Bush, Mitt Romney, Mar Marco Rubio, last time I checked, all Republicans, they all called him a liar, a fraud, a con man. Do you understand that that was during the primaries when they were fighting against each other? Agreed, but they didn't call each other liars. They only called ever, him a liar. Have you ever worked in a campaign before? They I didn't. can tell you have not. I, Let me tell you what happened. Can you tell me who else the they called a liar, Mark? They didn't call each other liars. They, they certainly him. did call each other liars. You no, know that Mark, they no, called no, Huckabee liars. They, they never called, called any other candidate a con man, a fraud, and a cancer on conservatism. Those were only reserved for your candidate. No, it's not true what you're saying. I want you. Hold on. Are you saying Donald Trump lies just like every other politician lies? Is that your? Is that your position. I'm saying He's not that different. what Donald Trump is saying is intended to get results. Okay. And if you look at the results and start playing, These stop are playing fascinating this little game. So it's all, well, I want to invite so you. You and JD Gordon's position is he kind of does lie, but he gets elected, he gets things done. That's your argument. Have you fine. ever met a politician before? You sound <laughs> like you have. Now a few, let me tell you. But I've never met a politician good. who lies like Donald Trump, and I've interviewed people from across the world in that seat, and I've never met a politician who lies can, like Donald can Trump. Can you come to Austin, Texas, okay. to the Republican National Convention, and I will show you? You some people that will can completely this is the, disapprove this is my you favorite defense I've us. ever heard of a Republican president from a Republican. Come to the Republican convention, we're all liars over there. That's it's just not a weird, what I said. It's just a weird that defense. Is... Please. See? Please. See, you just lied. Okay. If I took that back to Texas and said that you were a liar, I okay. would also have all these quotes and so all of these things. So, so just, just out of interest, unfair. when he says the head of the Boy Scouts called me up, and the head of the Boy Scouts says he didn't call me up, and Sarah Sanders says he didn't call Maddie, me up. what is that? Maddie, what why did you, you tell me this yesterday, I knew, and I could call them up and ask them what really I happened? Knew you're you were, tricking me here. Mark, what you're answering a question with a question again. You They're even, thinking you would offer the defense. You won't even so let me use Google right here or make a phone call to see what's happening. Okay. Ellie Garenmeyer. No, I'm going to come to Ellie next. Ellie Garenmeyer is from the uh, Count, uh, European Council on Foreign Relations. From a foreign policy perspective, I'm fascinated because we can talk about Trump's lies all day long. But what's the impact on international relations? How we talked earlier in the show about his impact on allies versus Putin. How do allied governments around the world? How do European governments, when Donald Trump's the president, can they take him seriously? Do they take him seriously, in your view? Look, I think they take him very seriously. Uh, but I think there has been significant damage done to the trust relationship. Alliances work on trust and solidarity, and I think both of those have been significantly tarnished in the last year and a half. When you have a statement that's released and within 24 hours, President Trump reneges on that uh, to the G7. Uh, when you have um, statement after statement uh, to di different world leaders saying that he will do one thing, yeah. but at the end of the day ends up doing something else, it creates a very unpredictable, chaotic Is situation. It in your view? I think it's significantly dangerous because the, the last, you know, since World War II, these alliance structures have managed to prevent uh, significant conflicts happening no. around the world. And no. let, me, let me just add one more thing okay. because I think I heard that uh, the United States doesn't want to be the policeman of the world. Well, what we've seen in the last year and a half is essentially the United States being the mobster of the world in terms of threatening allies, in terms of uh, pressuring through duress uh, to keep raising the bar. And this is how, th this is how we are... And, and let me put Mark's point to you that, you know, politicians lie. 
You've been studying world leaders, foreign governments, foreign policy for many years now. Have you come across any other politician who behaves in this way? Trudeau. That's okay. why. Does That's Trudeau, why he does Trudeau behave you? in the same way as Donald Trump? What I can say is yeah. that, speaking at least to many European policymakers in the last year and a half, people are baffled. They may not say this publicly, but in private, people okay. are baffled. Let me put the same question to David K. Johnston, who is a Trump biographer, award-winning journalist. Let me ask you this. Politicians lie. Donald Trump lies a bit more than the rest, a lot more than the rest. Is there something different about Donald Trump when it comes to this kind of... Donald is in a class all by himself. And for the 30 years I've known Donald, he creates his own reality. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of video and audio tape of where Donald says something and two minutes later denies that he says that he said that. Uh, Donald has uh, willing to lie in amazing forums. He has twice been tried for income tax fraud and lost both cases. He's a confessed sales tax cheat. That's lies. This is a man who has testified under oath that he didn't know anything about uh, who the faculty were of the scam called Trump University when he, in an ad, said, I will personally pick the faculty. And he was shown every name. He didn't know them. Donald Trump lies with so, the ease so with which you, you and I you, agree. You, so you can, you, 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 you've mentioned a few lies, or I mentioned a few lies. Hey, let's, get to the, let's get behind that. I just want to ask, does he tell these lies? Does he say these things, his own reality? Because he's a cynical politician who is making, you know, he's not afraid to make brazenly false statements in order to get things done, get elected, whatever. Or is he just deluded? Has he kind of lost his mind? I always wonder, is, is this a kind of deliberate falsehood or is this just, ah, he couldn't remember? Uh, uh, which there one? Are, there, are, there are occasions in which I've dealt with Donald in which his lies were strategic and I could see the logic of them, but he literally is delusional at times. And in my books, I lay out his own statements that show they're delusional. Remember that Donald Trump says, I am the world's greatest expert in all time about taxes and then demonstrates he doesn't know jack about taxes. He doesn't know accounting. He doesn't know uh, net present value. If you don't know those, you can't know taxes. He has said in numerous forums things that make clear that he doesn't know anything. One of his professors at Penn, you know, called him the damn dumbest student I ever had in my life. J.D. Gordon, do you, do you recognize that picture of Donald Trump? I just want to get to the bottom of someone who's actually worked with him and given him advice. Yeah, in, in my uh, personal interactions, I'd say he was very brilliant, very sharp guy. Can you give me an example? Questions. Can you give me an example of the brilliance? Sure. Yeah. He had very insightful questions about relationships with NATO, with Europe, our alliances, dollars and cents. He's a very big dollars and cents guy. He doesn't understand how NATO works. Well, he does. He understands... He says Germany owes America money. That's not how NATO works. You're a former soldier. You know that. He says things that will prompt a reaction from our allies to get them to pony up more money. Because... So, he's just so when he's lying, he's just pretending not to know? No, I was and not. Why does he not. keep repeatedly claiming a false thing? He tries, he... He tries to make a point. And so okay. sometimes it's, it's not point, exactly... What's the point? That I'm a liar. ...technically correct... Sometimes it's strategically. Are we back to strategically and technically. Oh, I, He's admire, trying to make I admire your persistent JD Gordon. Let's go to our very patient audience in the Oxford Union. The gentleman in the front row here, and then we'll go to somebody at the back. So, uh, my name's Ahmed. I'm a graduate student here. On the campaign trail, President Trump called for the total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Then, as president, he introduced a executive order banning entry from those from seven Muslim-majority countries. Do you believe it is compatible with the America's core ideals that we welcome all people, regardless of religion, race, or background, given the policy's roots? Okay. Thank you, Akhman, for that question. Shall I respond now? Yes, please. Uh, well, basically, of those seven countries you mentioned, one's North Korea and one's Venezuela, which are not Muslim-majority countries. The other countries on that list have a problem with security screening. They can't do the appropriate background checks. We're talking about Libya, Syria, Yemen, places that are undergoing civil wars right now, or at least a, a low-level low conflict, and they can't vet terrorists from those countries. That's why they're on the list right now. It makes perfect sense. It's not a Muslim ban. It's, a, it's a ban against countries that don't vet people the way we would like them to. We can have a debate about whether this order is a Muslim ban or not, and the Supreme Court has decided it isn't, to be fair. But here's what I don't get. You worked on the Donald Trump campaign, and during the campaign, it was a Muslim ban. He said, no Muslims from anywhere. Me, I can't come into the US. My friends can't come into the US. Any Muslim cannot come into the United States. Right. Did you support that while you worked for him? Uh, no. He said something that I wouldn't have said and I didn't support, you however. You were his director of national security. You can't just wash your hands of major no, 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 we didn't. statements. What we did is said, OK, well, well how's that going to work in practice? So you reined them in. You reined in the bigotry. I wouldn't characterize it that way. You don't think I, banning all Muslims in the United States is bigoted? It, it, it wasn't a good thing to say. And he, didn't, he doesn't say that now. He's changed his position. Okay, let's, uh, let's go back to the audience. I said I'll get someone in the back. Uh, yes, lady here in the red jacket. 
Hello, my name is Isabel Dominguez. I come from a family, a Venezuelan, Venezuelan family, that has immigrated to Miami, Florida, which is a refuge to countless Venezuelans who have fled the severe political and economic conflict there. Mr. Trump recently suggested using military intervention to alleviate the conflict there, despite some federal opposition. What is your opinion, Mr. Gordon, on Mr. Trump's remark? Thanks, Isabella. And I'm very sorry to see what's happening in Venezuela. It's horrible. I was there in 1999. Since then, about 4 million Venezuelans have left the country. Uh, it's a tragedy unfolding every day. But what I would tell you is that allegedly what happened is Mr. Trump asked his advisors about it. So number one, there's no shortage of things President Trump won't say or won't ask. No shortage of that. Number two, there's no shortage of people that are disgruntled around him for a variety of reasons, who quit, get fired, so then they tell the press, which is number three. There are no shortage of people in the press who will spin any little nugget of information into a sensational story. So do I believe he asked that question? I do. Do I believe he suggested it? Of course not. You, he asked a question but didn't suggest it? No, no, no. It's fine to ask a question. You can ask anything you want. Do you think but Donald Trump wanted it. to invade Venezuela? I don't. I you don't. don't. He, I just, don't. he just put it out there for fun. Well, no, no, it's not that. I have some experience on the campaign with that, where he'll ask a hypothetical question and then someone will leak it in a very underhanded way. But he also way. said it to several Latin American leaders. Maybe he shouldn't tell foreign governments that part of the world he wants to invade. Okay, let's go back to the audience. Let's take a lady here in the second row. Um, uh, once again, we've heard the view of Russia being an international pariah influencing and meddling in elections. So I wanted to ask the panel and our guest to perhaps name two important benefits that Russia has gained, or is likely to gain, by influencing the elections of the United States. Uh, just out of interest, are you skeptical of claims that Russia interfered in the US election? I'm skeptical as to whether it was the Russian state, because I'm not sure that there is sufficient proof that it was the Russian state, that it was Kremlin itself that was meddling in the elections. Was it the Kremlin itself that was meddling? We've seen recent indictments of 12 GRU intelligence assets by the Robert Mueller investigation. Do you believe it was the Kremlin itself that was interfering? I do, but that said, I don't believe that it impacted the election to have President Trump win. I think that he beat a candidate who was deeply flawed in Hillary Clinton. Okay, but. He he beat her in three states by 80,000 votes. I know, he did. So it wasn't exactly a big margin of victory. So any, little, any, any, any little help, any little help can win. Um, lady here in the second row. Hi. Um, putting Trump's questionable policies aside, do you believe that someone who has been accused of sexual assault multiple times and has essentially admitted to it on camera deserves to lead the United States? He deserves to leave the United States because he was elected by the American people. So the American people have to decide that, and they did, and he won. Do you think someone like that serves as an appropriate role model, though, to young people? Bill Clinton. Well, <laughs> certainly had Bill Clinton, as Mark points out, and he had sex in the White House with Monica Lewinsky, an so intern, we're no he was impeached. Than we were. I don't want to get into whataboutism, however. That's exactly um, what you're doing. I was. Okay. I was getting into whataboutism. I mean, but Mark shouting out Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton. That's true. You didn't work for Bill Clinton. You I worked for Donald Trump. I didn't, right, How right. did you work for a man like that, credibly accused of sexual assault by dozens of women? Well, I personally didn't see that. My interactions with him were entirely professional. Uh, I thought he was very sharp on his game, and so I didn't see that. And so yeah, what I would tell you is that... So you only Americans comment on things are, you see. Well, that... Did you see, Bill, did you see Bill Clinton I, having an affair in the White House? You were happy, I, I to, comment, you were happy to comment what? on that a moment ago. He was impeached. Okay, but you didn't see him having sex. Yeah. Let's go back to the audience. Let's go back to... Gentlemen yes. here in the black jacket. Uh, how much of the uh, negative media coverage um, concerning Russia do you think is down to Democrats' personal hatred for Donald Trump rather than legitimate evidence? Well, it's not just Democrats. There are a lot of Republicans, too. Uh, there was uh, a Republican senator who had one of his aides come here to London to get the dossier from Christopher Steele, the ex-MI6 uh, agent. His assistant, his colleague, brought it back to Washington, and that senator, Senator McCain, gave it to the FBI director, James Comey. To me, that's not very ethical. It's not just Democrats. Okay, but let me, I, I just want to bring in Mark Porter, who's from Republicans Overseas, who's here. I, I, J.D. Gordon throughout this show has been actually quite forthright on the kind of Russian role, the Kremlin role, as he put it. I just want to put the same question to you that the, the audience member asked. How much do you accept that, no, there's a legitimate... Bob Mueller should be investigating this. There is a legitimate investigation, even if you don't agree with some of the indictments. Or how much is it all just a democratic left conspiracy, in your view? Well, the, the thing to consider here is that what's the result of the election? So the election, in my opinion, in the opinion of most Americans, is that the Russian influences, whatever they were, whatever they did, did not influence the outcome of the election. 
David, very briefly. Let's assume that the Russians were not successful in their efforts and didn't have any influence. That has nothing to do with the fact that unregistered foreign agents of the Russians, people on the Russian payroll, were the national security advisor, were the campaign manager, that we've had five guilty pleas, that we, we recently had 13 GRU officers indicted by the Mueller campaign. There's lots of evidence that there was a conspiracy going on. Gentleman there has been waiting for a while in the white shirt. Yep. Mr. Gordon, on the campaign trail, President Trump was a determined isolationist and he's now changed to be every inch a belligerent. And my question to you is why has he betrayed his voters? Could it be because with his election, the populist rise of left-wing politics has taken hold in the US and he sees left-wing governments in North Korea and Venezuela as easy targets? Or is it because he's engaging in the Bill Clinton exercise of bombing other countries to distract from a sex scandal? Well, I disagree with your premise. I think it's a good question, but I disagree with your premise that he's turned into a, a belligerent president. He had two limited strikes against Syria in retaliation for chemical weapons use, killing children, uh, women and children, innocent civilians. And so Ivanka he's, had showed those pictures and on, he reacted. He's, he's upped the civilian death toll in Syria, yeah. in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Yemen, in all of these places. American military well, involvement was higher. Civilian casualties are higher on Trump's watch even than Obama's, and Obama was a pretty belligerent president. Well, that's the Saudi coalition in Yemen. That's, that's not being the U.S. Fueled, flying which is being fueled and armed by the U.S. And the Iranians, again, are in Yemen, causing okay. the whole okay. problem. OK, but I'm not speaking to an Iranian. I'm speaking to a Donald Trump supporter, so I'm asking you about Donald Trump. Right. Donald Trump is trying to mitigate some of the, the things being done by countries like Iran. I mean, but he's being belligerent in doing so. OK, let's go to the audience. I'm going to take the lady there at the front. Yes. My question is, do you think Donald Trump will get re-elected in 2020? Great question. He very well may. Depends will, on who will he, runs against will him. Will he need Russian help in 2020? <laughs> uh, low blow. No. I was gonna... no. <laughs> you said... You said, you said the Kremlin helped him. You said it, not me. It really depends okay. on who runs against him, because if okay. a person's very well qualified and... Can do, get the votes the way. Do qualifications matter? I mean, has Donald Trump proved that <laughs> qualifications you, don't matter? How do you define qualifications? You can, I mean, if you can be on Home Alone 2 and be president, you can be president. There you uh, go. Gentlemen here in the glasses. Briefly, as an American based in northeastern Nigeria, we partner on a daily basis with 190 million Nigerians. And I think very simply, I just, I have trouble squaring the forest for the tree argument. How does calling their country a hole <laughs> increase our national security? Well, thank you for your service. In Nigeria, I know it must be very difficult uh, over there. I, I think he's a plain spoken guy. Um, he says whatever he wants, let the chips fall where they may. And besides, that was a comment that was supposed to be among senators, got leaked out. Who knows if it's exactly what he said? There's been a lot of debate about that. But here's a, here's a guy who says whatever he wants. And like I said, uh, I think the West should get used to that. More reality TV stars will be elected because that's all it takes is to win the majority of the votes but not every reality in the TV, electoral college. Not every, uh, not every reality TV star is a racist, to be fair to reality TV stars. He's not a racist. I wouldn't say he's a racist, but I, I would say I know you wouldn't that, say that, but that, you've not actually told me why. Yeah, um, uh, get used let, to this. More is going to come me, as far as reality uh, We're TV. getting used to it. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, let me ask you one last question. You advised Donald Trump during a critical period of his campaign. You didn't get a job in government. You've got masses of debt, I believe, from uh, all the Russia stuff. Uh, and Donald Trump seems to have hung people like you out to dry. Are you just another one of the president's many, many victims? Well, that's a good question, too, from what a lot of people see in the press and, and what they know of it. I did uh, get five-figure legal bills in this witch hunt. Fortunately, my uh, campaign colleague, Michael Caputo, raised a third of a million dollars on a legal fund, and he was able to pay my legal bills off entirely, hmm. uh, thanks to him. Uh, but, you know, President Trump just basically moves forward, and if, if people quit or they get fired or something happens to them, that's just the nature of the he business. He just doesn't give a damn Trump. about them. It's what happens. It's, it's kind of unfortunate that a lot of people have been scooped up in the witch hunt. What I can tell you is if you work for President Trump, there are, there's no shortage of people who want to crucify you and come after your scalp. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity to come to Oxford and speak with you because and, of my role in the campaign. And you're so. still as loyal to Trump, a fan of Trump, as you were in summer of 2016? Well, I would say that, what's the alternative? Hillary Clinton? She would have been a lot That's worse. That's not a rigging endorsement. I'll be honest with you, Jamie. Well, I, I think that... Uh, Are you a Trump, fan of Trump? What's the alternative? I'm a fan of what Mr. Trump is doing for his policies Fair in general. Enough. I can't support everything he Fair says enough. or tweets, but overall, I'm supportive of his policies, and I defend them all the time. J.D. Gordon, we'll have to leave it there. I want to thank our audience here in the Oxford Union. I want to thank our panel of experts, and I want to thank J.D. Gordon for joining us as our guest here in the Oxford Union tonight. Thank you for coming on Head to Head. Thank you, Maddie. The show will be back next week.